distinguished visitor this, this week. We're trying to be as uh, wide-ranging in our visiting, our distinguished visitors as we can be. And we have today the head of the Beijing office of the Financial Times, Jamil Andolini, sitting here. And you will see that he's not as elderly as some of the people we get as, uh, as distinguished visitors. Uh, it'll change, but... <laughs> Barely distinguished at all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. no. But, uh, so he, he seems to be talking about... Talking himself out of a job, potentially, or making a case... Making for, a case, uh, yeah. for, for continuing. Uh, you can see the, the title on the screen. Uh, I, I'm going to push my chair sideways so that I can see it. But anyway, I, I welcome him very much. and uh, yeah. There will be a better occasion for giving a, a brief biography uh, tomorrow. But I should just say that uh, I actually uh, Mr. Andalini has a very interesting history. But he did start from what for a journalist might be taken to be the right education, English literature. Oh. Thought you'd like that, David. <laughs> In New Zealand. <laughs> That's what I told my parents. <laughs> and he has already come quite a long way. Uh, the Financial Times has been doing such good reporting on China that you might reasonably think that it no longer counted, uh, that he no longer counted as a foreign correspondent. But certainly by nationality, you, you mix of nationalities, but Chinese is not one of them. Although uh, his wife is Chinese, so it's close. Uh, I look forward to the dis this discussion and be ready to prod him with questions and comments when, uh, when he's finished. Jamil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So um, I've been told to keep it relatively brief. Um, I've got, I can, I can talk and talk. So uh, I'm going to talk about 15, 20, 20 minutes probably to begin with, and then, um, and then uh, open it up for questions or discussion. Uh, happy to answer anything that you um, that you want to ask. It doesn't have to be about my talk necessarily, but obviously that's what I'm prepared for. Um, thank you very much, Sir James. I'm really, I'm really pleased and honored to be here this week. It's, uh, I have to say it's, it's my first sort of uh, dabbling in the academic world, and it's, uh, so far I love it. Uh, so, um, lots of dinners and chats, and uh, um, I've, been, I've been doing some work. As you, I picked up the... Um, I picked up, I stole the newspaper from the uh, downstairs, <laughs> the Financial Times, um, and uh, because that's actually my story, and uh, as I was saying, I had dinner on Monday night with some of the professors, and uh, I had to go away and take a phone call, I had to go back, and I had to finish writing the story, and then I was very pleased to see it um, uh, full page in the paper on Tuesday, so um, being in academic life gives me a lot of time to... Uh, to go and do my day job as well, which is uh, quite amazing. Um, so, the top of my, t of my talk tonight is, uh, as you can see there, the role of traditional media and uh, the foreign correspondent in the age of Twitter and Weibo. Um, if you read the headlines, you'll know that probably um, from the outside it looks like, and from the inside for a lot of people, it really looks like traditional media are in crisis, serious crisis. Um, but I'm going to explain to you tonight, hopefully, and convince you, hopefully tonight, why, I'm, uh, why there is a future for what I do. Um, 
obviously it's a little self-serving. It's, it's, uh, I'm talking about my own future. But I truly believe um, that newspapers, in whatever form they end up in, uh, are going to survive. Newspapers like the Financial Times, the New York Times, the South China Morning Post, which I used to work for um, many years ago. I truly believe that, there, that these will not only survive, but will thrive in the future. And so I'm going to try and make my case for it uh, and hopefully convince you of that tonight. Um, first thing I'm going to show you is not my Twitter account. It's, uh, this is the Washington Post reporting on the Washington Post being sold to the, uh, the owner of Amazon, um, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. So this was just a, the, the deal finally closed on uh, the 1st of October. This was a momentous occasion for anyone in journalism. We woke up and we're like, my God, when we heard it, I think it was a month or so earlier. This was a really big deal because this is someone from new media buying old media. And obviously the Washington Post, many of you will have seen movies about uh, Watergate. That was the, you know, Washington Post broke the Watergate story. Um, it's, it's really the kind of, when we think of what is the old, great, powerful institution in, in uh, old media, it's this newspaper. Um, and so this was a real wake-up moment, I think, for, for the industry. Um, quite scary for a lot of people, especially working at the Washington Post, since they Probably many of them thought they were going to be out of a job quite soon. Um, uh, but I think um, another, another thing that was even more uh, of a shock, I think, for everyone, was the, sale of the, um, was the sale of the Boston Globe, which happened uh, also in, in August. Um, and I've got another thing here. The, uh, the Boston Globe was bought by a guy called John Henry, who owns the, uh, the Boston Red Sox. Uh, I know some of you are big Boston Red Sox fans. Um, but uh, he bought <laughs> there, yeah, um, he bought the Boston Globe for $70 million in August. He bought it from the New York Times, and the New York Times in 1993 paid $1.1 $1 .1 billion for the, globe, for the Boston Globe. So it's gone from being worth $1.1 $1 billion 20 years, uh, 20 years ago to being worth $70 million. That's a big, I'm sure the finance uh, students in the room can work out the uh, percentage drop. Um, really scary for, for, well, terrible for the New York Times, who've lost a lot of money, but uh, also quite worrying for journalists because you see how your value has uh, decreased over just a 20-year period. Uh, other, other newspapers you can see on here, there's the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer was, Inquirer was sold for even less, 55 million. The Omaha World Herald was bought by Warren Buffett. Uh, I, my hunch is that if, he, if he'd bought it this year, it would have been worth a lot less than 200 million. I think he probably lost quite a lot of money on that as well. Newsday, Minneapolis Star Tribune, the LA Times went bankrupt, Chicago Tribune. So if you're looking around as a foreign correspondent in Beijing, for example, you're watching correspondents from the LA Times go home and no one come to replace them. You're watching people, actually there is one person for the LA Times still left. Uh, she'll, she'll never leave, I think. Um, but uh, there are, you know, you watch one after another, these smaller newspapers, smaller news organizations, their foreign correspondents are leaving. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a worrying time. It's a, it's a scary time. Um, most people, and especially I would say advertisers, are asking why they should pay for ink on, printed on dead wood. Um, why would you want a clunky newspaper website that gives you something that's trying to charge you for something you can basically get free on the internet. So this is the thing, I mean, this is why journalists like me are uh, maybe looking around at academic postings and uh, <laughs> other things around the world, you know, other possible career paths just in case, you know, we're sold to someone who doesn't believe in journalists or doesn't believe in uh, foreign correspondents, for example. Um, the new media and the, uh, the whole shift onto the web and the shift of advertisers in particular, this is really changing not just our, the economics of our industry, it's also changing the way that we do our jobs. So when I used to come in in the morning to the FT, I've been working at the FT for about seven years. So I started 
seven years ago, I was the junior guy in the office. Uh, I was very keen. I'd come in the morning. And, but it was really nice because what I could do is I could first read all the Chinese papers, then I could read the Western you know, English papers, and then I could go to a press conference or have a meeting, an interview. Um, and then I could go back to my office and I could read what Reuters and Bloomberg and uh, the, uh, Dow Jones and the wire services, who have to <coughs> do things much faster, uh, I could read what they said about the press conference I was just at and I could sort of cheat a little bit and say, oh, you know, they missed this or they missed that. And I could kind of, I, well, I never copied anything, of course, but I could go, oh, that was a good idea, yeah. And I'd go back to my notes. And so it was a kind of a leisurely existence. At the end of the day, about 4 or 5 p.m., maybe 6 p.m., I would sit down at my desk and I would, uh, I would write a beautifully crafted, uh, relying on my English literature degree, uh, even though it was from New Zealand, but still, you know, uh, um, I could rely on that and write these, these beautifully crafted, you know, I'd maybe read a bit of Hemingway, oh, get some inspiration, go write my, you know, my, uh, a couple of paragraphs. And I could, I could do that end of the day, and then I would send my story off by email, or yeah, usually by email. And it would go to my, an editor in Hong Kong, and then the editor in Hong Kong would maybe make a few changes, send it to an editor in London. They would maybe make a few changes, not usually with my stories, but with other people's a lot more changes. Uh, and then they would put it in the newspaper. And then as a kind of afterthought, a day later, uh, it would go up on our website at something like 10 a.m. the next day. I mean, it was as a, really an afterthought. You, you'd look at the website, and it would be kind of the things you'd read already if you'd read your newspaper. Um, and, and nothing else. It was literally a, a bad copy of the, of the newspaper. Today I come in in the morning, now it's 8 a.m. instead of 11 or 12. Um, now I'm supposed to be there really early. Uh, I'll write, uh, I'll, I'll get in, there'll be some economic numbers will come out and I'll quickly write 300 words about the economic numbers and I'll send it off and then I'll come back to it and I'll call a few people, get some quotes and I'll write another version of that and then I'll write maybe another more polished version at the end of the day. And the newspaper, I'm going to show you an example. So uh, I want you to tell me what you notice about, um, so this is, I can't read, I think this is the Europe edition. This is the, I think, Asia edition. I can't read it. You maybe can read it a bit. Yeah, maybe not. Um, this is the, I think, uh, Middle East maybe. And this, this is the Middle East version, Asia, USA. And Europe. And do you, what do you notice about these these uh, front pages of today's newspaper? Uh, almost. The thing that's the same, actually, is the stories. So, our readers in the Middle East. Asia, US, and Europe are reading the exact same front page of their newspaper. So this newspaper, this is the day before actually, so this newspaper that came out yesterday, if you were in New York you would have got the exact same front page. Now less than a year ago, less than a year ago, probably six months ago, this would be the Asia front page and the US page would be completely different stories on the front. Europe would be completely different. So in Europe, they'd have more Europe stories. In America, they'd have more Europe, uh, American stories. In Europe, you know, Asia, it'd be all Asian stories. But now you look, this is, a, this is about Twitter and Blackberry. This is about bees. <laughs> Very FT, core FT topic, bees. Well, we're saying how sweets and snacks, are in, their prices of sweets and snacks are increasing because almond prices are increasing because bees are dying off. So very FT take on a general news story. But basically, this is exactly the same no matter where you are in the world. Uh, and six months ago, that wasn't the case. It was very different. Um, but, but good spotting on the ads. The only thing that's different, actually, on all these pages is that Americans don't want to buy Louis Vuitton watches. They want to buy whatever that is. I can't read it, but other kind of luxury watch. Um, so that's the only difference now, which is which is pretty astonishing and um, it tells you so nowadays what we do with the newspaper and it's just changed literally just in the last couple of months is that I will write for the website I'll write all my stories based on you know what we hope to put on the web and the newspaper is a snapshot it's basically a best of a greatest hits of whatever we put on the website over the last 24 hours 
So people like me, who still really love to read their newspaper, are kind of getting news um, from, you know, over the last 24 hours, and they're hopefully getting the best kind of possible global news, not really targeted to me sitting in Beijing, but, but the best sort of global snapshot of what's, of what's happening. Uh, we've also, what we're doing is we're talking about moving to something like a broadcast schedule. And this is a really interesting concept for us because we, we are used to dealing with deadlines. And it wasn't just different uh, international editions that we, that we used to do. We also used to do various editions through the evening. So, for example, um, the front page might be about bees, but then uh, a plane flies into the Twin Towers. And so the second or third editions will be about that, obviously, a breaking news event. We no longer have pretty much the capability to do that because, but we can online, we'll be instant. We have, we have stories up there that, uh, on, on the latest breaking news. Um, but we no longer do these kind of uh, uh, multiple editions. Um, so that's a, a big, what, what this means for us effectively, at the moment at least, in this transi transition stage, is that I, I mean, my specialty and what I love to do and what wins prizes and gets people knowing who you are are investigative, pe investigative pieces, pieces that are deep, uh, thoughtful journalism. Uh, I like to think ones like uh, this one that I, uh, that I did on Tuesday's paper that I was writing after the dinner we had. So this is a full page. It, um, it took me about a week or so, and it's, it's really, you know, lots of interviews, lots of finding out what is, what is it like for foreign businesses right now in China and how is that going to change and uh, what's happening with Xi Jinping, what is he talking about in his propaganda and what, what's happening, why is he locking up lots of journalists and, uh, and dissidents and uh, why is he talking like Mao Zedong and why are the posters of Leifeng everywhere in Beijing, which is kind of nuts. But, uh, um, you know, so that was, that was, you know, a serious piece of work. But in order to do that, I had to literally say no to a desk editor in Hong Kong who's trying to fill the website. I had to say no probably 20 times in the period of that week because he'd call me up and say, oh, we need a story about something. I said, no, no, I'm working on my long piece about, uh, you know, why are there posters of Leifeng everywhere in, uh, in Beijing? So really the problem we have at the moment from a very practical perspective is that we don't have the time or the space or the energy to, to do the real, the real journalism that really makes a difference, that wins the Pulitzers, we haven't won a Pulitzer yet, but we're going to, uh, that wins the prizes, that, that does, you know, makes an impact, that makes everyone sit up and say, wow, that's, uh, that's a really big deal. Also, for the smart media that are really, under, or really starting to understand how social media has, uh, has changed our industry, uh, you know, Twitter, Weibo, uh, Facebook, these can be amazing tools for pe to get people to come and read your stuff, right? So if you get something trending on, on, uh, on Weibo or, you know, Drudge Report or Huffington Post or one of these big news aggregators that starts, that picks up stories, if you can get something trending on, on those, you'll get millions and millions more, you know, sometimes literally millions of people coming to read your story and linking through. And sometimes it's, it's stories about bees and things that just get, happen to get picked up by some young intern at Huffington Post decides and then suddenly that's your story go, goes massive across the web. So there are, there are some news organizations that have really uh, understood this. There's one called Quartz, which is very interesting. It's online only and what it does is it's built everything around social me media and the idea is that everyone should be, they want everyone to come to them through Twitter, through uh, through Facebook. So, so it's obviously can be a very powerful tool for getting your story, stories out to a, to a much broader audience. Um, now possibly it's because I'm, uh, I'm only 36 but in the world of uh, new media I'm almost a dinosaur unfortunately. Um, so here is my really really bad uh, Twitter um, front page. There's a really bad photo I took in the hallway of my office. Um, you can all see that. Uh, terrible. I keep getting mocked about it. Um, and here are my tweets. The last one I did was... Does it have the date? I don't, I don't go on Twitter enough for me to know even... But that is the sum total of my tweets. I did them all in a sort of one-day period. 
one, two, three, four, five, six tweets in total, all on the same thing, which is a story I was really proud of and I wanted everyone to read. <laughs> and it only came out on September 21st. So you can see the first and last time I properly tweeted was uh, September 21st, or around about then. Um, now you might think, what a loser, but um, <laughs> I, I've got, I think I've got really good reasons for, for and my, my Weibo account looks even worse, but um, I've, got, I've got really good reasons, I think. Um, I'm very wary of Twitter as, um, as a media professional, because uh, you see a lot of people like to put their, my wife, for example, likes to put pictures of her meals up on her Weibo account. <laughs> which I think is mad, but uh, you know, so we all have to stop before we eat and take a photo and then put it up. I'm sure some of you in the room maybe are guilty of this as well. Um, so, but once you start getting into the habit of tweeting and putting things out there, it becomes second nature. I'm sure some of you know about this, right? So you'll have your iPhone or your whatever and your, your iPad and you'll just start to tweet and you'll tweet about whatever and oh, you'll see something cool and you'll tweet about it. And what tends to happen is that you blur the lines between your professional, because when I tweet, I have to use, I have to identify, identify myself. Unfortunately, my name's not Joe Smith or uh, Jim Clark. Um, so, you know, Jamil Andalini, there's only one of us and we work for the Financial Times. It's only me. And so I have to identify myself as a Financial Times journalist. So once that line blurs between my personal and my professional life, uh, I start writing things, flippant things like, oh, Xi Jinping looks fat today, or, um, you know, oh, I think uh, such and such is, is silly. Uh, you know, as journalists, we try and keep our personal uh, opinions about our subject matter very distinct from our professional judgment on what we're writing about, right? So we, our greatest goal is to be objective as much as we can. Of course, we have an argument and we try and come down on, a, uh, you know, make a strong case for something. As I was saying earlier, we like to simplify and then exaggerate. Um, but we try and keep our personal prejudices, maybe uh, personal um, feelings about things, out of the stories. Um, and the danger is once you get into tweeting about your personal life or whatever you happen to be doing, I think there is a very, very big danger that those things could be held against you, even if you say something completely out of context. And I know for a fact that the Communist Party of China, the Propaganda Department, the Foreign Ministry, they keep a very, very good record of all of our stories. Um, and everything, well, they keep all our emails too, although they, <laughs> that's not public, but, um, and I can't avoid that. But uh, they do you know, monitor us very, very closely. And if I'm out there publicly sort of throwing ideas around and throwing thoughts around, um, I'm, I'm endangering my reputation as, a, as an objective, independent journalist, I think, and uh, also the reputation of the Financial Times, which is um, really, I would say, very valuable, a 125-year-old brand. We were, we were established in 1888 and uh, have a relatively good brand to, to protect. So um, I'm also really worried about drunk tweeting. <laughs> so I'm worried about one night maybe having a couple too much wines with Sir James and then sort of stumbling home and saying something wrong or, you know, silly or, or misspelling something, you know, then it, it, who knows? Nobody knows that I've had a few too many wines and then people read that I can't spell properly but I work for the Financial Times. I mean, really, you know, that would be a loser thing to do. So, um, also, you know, new, new media, social media are a very useful and powerful tool for us as journalists. I mean, it's really changed the way that we cover breaking events, for example. So. It used to be in China, we'd, we'd have a, there'd be a riot in uh, Henan, you know, some big protest or some big uh, riot somewhere. And we wouldn't know about it usually for, at, at, the, at, the, at best, we'd know about it three or four or five days later when someone maybe put a photo up on, on the BBS or something like that, or someone would come and bring us, you know, some pictures or some footage of this protest. But by then, it's hard to write about something that's already over and already finished. So, but now, instantaneous so people will, will start taking pictures start taking video and they'll immediately upload it to their Weibo or to their Weixin to their networks and it will it's viral in, in instantaneously and it goes straight to us and so we can we don't just have to rely on talking to eyewitnesses because people can exaggerate or they can say I'm pretty sure and then you push them and they say oh I heard it from my cousin or whatever um, if they've got video and pictures up immediately we can judge for ourselves having seen bombings and riots and these sorts of things in the past, we can judge, is this big or is this small? Do we need to care? Do we need to write about it? Do we need to uh, 
um, really follow up. So it's a very powerful and important tool, but at the same time, because it's democratized information and information uh, gathering and, and you know, news, news uh, uh, spreading, it's, uh, it's been democratized, but at the same time, it allows anyone um, who, you know, many people who don't have the training or the judgment or the uh, experience as a, of a journalist, they can literally hear something from their cousin or their brother or their IE or their driver or whatever and say, oh, oh and put it straight onto the, onto the uh, internet on their Weibo as if it's a fact. And so I think the government has, uh, in China right now, has done something really terrible by bringing in uh, their new anti-rumor uh, legislation. The new anti-rumor legislation, as probably many of you know, means that if your post to Twitter, it's another reason why I don't do it, uh, if it's retweeted um, more than 500 times or seen by 3,000 people or more and the government decides it's a rumor, <laughs> they get to decide, um, you can go to jail for three years. So it's another reason I'm very, very, very careful. Although they would probably see that story that I posted as some, they would probably uh, decide that was a rumor since the title was How Long Can the Communist Party Survive in China? Uh, <laughs> according to the Communist Party, that's a terrible malicious rumor. So um, anyway, so, so um, but they do have a real problem. So on the one hand, I think I deplore that legislation. But on the other hand, they do have a serious issue that because the, go the government and the Communist Party have controlled information so tightly for so long, now with the flowering of uh, social media, people believe almost anything if it's not coming from the government. They don't believe the government, but they believe their Weixin buddies and their Weibo, the people they follow on Weibo. They're more likely to believe that than they are to believe CCTV or Xinhua because they've been lied to by those organizations for so, so many decades. Um, but the danger in that is that the people who are throwing things out on Weibo are not professional journalists usually and are not qualified to decide whether this, what they're putting out is a fact or, or not. And they don't have time or they're not you know, professional news gatherers. So um, a, a great example, uh, not Chinese example, was the Boston bombings, um, the Boston Marathon bombings. Uh, very soon after that, you saw CNN and other uh, large mainstream uh, media reporting that, uh, reporting, falsely reporting the name of a suspect in those bombings um, because they got it off Twitter. And I mean, this was just outrageous when you think about it. I mean, they, they thought they'd done some due diligence, but not enough. And in the interest of 24-hour news cycle and getting it out there first, um, they, they put this person's name out there. And my hunch is they will have serious uh, defamation and legal issues around that. They're probably being sued right now. Um, my mantra to my journalists, so we have about 20 people working in China and I'm supposed to direct uh, their coverage, very difficult sometimes, but um, uh, the, uh, of that about eight or nine are foreign correspondents and the others are news assistants who sort of help them so they don't publish themselves. But um, what I tell them is it's, it's much, much, much more important, I think, for us to be right than for us to be first. So what I aspire to is that People can go and read all sorts of junk on the internet, but it's not true until it's been in the Financial Times. Is that's the that's what I'm going for, and I think that's what uh, what um, I hope the Financial Times will end up standing for. Um, having talked through the pros and cons and given you the the sort of dire crisis disaster picture at the beginning, now I'm going to end on my optimistic note, which is unusual. Journalists like to go for the sort of if it bleeds, it's, it leads, we say. So we like this sort of sexy, bad story. But uh, I'm going to give you the, the optimistic view, which I truly believe. Um, I think in the future, given the amount of just rubbish information that's out there, the, the, just the sheer amount of information, whether it's good or bad, I truly believe that people are going to start to gravitate. I think we're already seeing it. We, they're going to gravitate back to the trusted brands in, uh, in media, like the New York Times, like... The Wall Street Journal, although they're our main enemy and we hate them and they're rubbish, don't read them. But uh, <laughs> Financial Times, uh, you know, in Hong Kong, South China Morning Post, obviously many other big, uh, the Ming Pao, maybe. <laughs> um, I think that these are going, people are going to increasingly come back because, number one, they don't have enough time to go, you know, scrolling through the internet trying to read every little report 
um, written badly often, written by people who don't know what they're talking about, people who have just copied it from somewhere else. Um, people are going to increasingly realize that there's so much false information, that there's too much information, that they're going to want to get um, a summary of the, the most important stories, and they want to gonna get, they're going to want to get the most authoritative stories, and they're going to turn to to big, powerful brands like us. As long as we don't devalue ourselves by always trying to be first, by always trying to make sure we're fighting with social media and beating, you know, Twitter. I mean, we, we can't. We're never going to. So, um, the key is that um, old, stodgy, dead wood producers like us have to understand the format that people now want to consume their their news in. Um, I don't think there's any less, uh, you know, appetite for, for good investigative journalism, for great news for, uh, gathering, for brilliant, sort of well put together journalism. I think, in fact, it's increasing with the access to the internet, with the access to all the uh, information that's out there. I think people are more willing, are more want to read the best journalism that's out there. Um, we, uh, until recently, uh, you know, the, the executives, at, in, I'm, I'm very much on the journalist side, um, I don't deal with the commercial side at all, um, that's a, they're a different animal, some people cross over, and I may rue the day that I just said this, because I may cross over one day, uh, hopefully not, but um, the people in the commercial side, on the business side, like to talk in like, nice slogans, like the Communist Party actually, like Xi Jinping, um, and until recently our, our big slogan was platform neutral, which meant that we would provide the news and you could read it on your iPhone or your iPad or your laptop or your newspaper and that was, uh, you know, we, we didn't distinguish. We, we give you it all on the same, on all these different uh, devices and, and uh, all these different media. Um, now we have a new slogan coming out of the uh, executive uh, halls of uh, the Financial Times. Uh, it's called Digital First. So in fact, we're not platform neutral anymore. We're very much coming down on the side of... Uh, iPads and iPhones, and uh, uh, part of this, I think, is that the iPad has just absolutely revolu revolutionized my industry, and it's really hard. I mean, I'm sure all of you have got iPads or, you know, love to use iPads, and it's, you know, changed a lot of people's lives, but really amazingly changed uh, journalists' lives, and I'll give you, a, I'll tell you something astonishing. It was about three years ago when the first iPad came out. Pearson, which is our parent company and has about 30,000 employees, bought an iPad for every single person in our company, including, uh, I think it was a little bit of a scam, but uh, including our driver, the IE in our office, uh, <laughs> including everyone, because uh, they happen to be on the payroll. Um, and I mean, amazing. So my driver now, while he's waiting for, in, in Beijing, he's worked for the Financial Times almost 20 years, he sits in the car when he's not sleeping, or um, he plays, uh, like he gambles on, <laughs> on uh, his iPad. Uh, I don't know if he's gambling money or not, because that's illegal in China, so uh, I, I turn a blind eye to that. Um, but uh, really, the iPad has, it, it, paradoxically, the iPad has saved traditional newspapers, I, I think, and it's a really um, fascinating uh, development. I was gonna talk a little bit about um, the FT strategy uh, more broadly, but I'll leave that if anyone's interested, um, talk a little bit more in detail about the, the uh, business strategy of the FT. I can talk to that a little bit, um, especially in how we, uh, how we uh, got rid of Apple. <laughs> we disintermediated the App Store, but I can talk about that after. Um, I, I would say, give one note of caution. I think that we have to be very careful about press freedom. There was, a, in an earlier age, of, uh, there was a guy called Randolph Hearst who was the big newspaper baron a uh, long time ago. I think we're, you know, if you look at how things are going for many newspapers, particularly in the US, you're seeing people like Jeff Bezos, so charismatic individual owners buying up newspapers. And uh, you have the owner of the Red Sox. So it's almost, you know, he owns, a, he owns a baseball team. Now he wants a newspaper. It's like a trophy, right? So you're sitting around and you're in your private jet and you're showing off to your buddies in your ski chalet in Aspen or whatever and it's like, well, what newspaper did you get? Oh, I got the LA Times. You know? so it's almost like a trophy now if you're very wealthy. Um, uh, you get your Learjet and then you get your newspaper. Um, uh, I think there's a danger of activist ownership, which has been a danger in the past many times over the, over the years. I think there's also uh, a danger with um, large state ownership like the Communist Party. Uh, increasing its influence on global 
Uh, media, I think that's a negative trend, personally. I'm happy to talk about that after if you want to ask me about it. Um, but I think ov overall, I'm very, very optimistic. I think that my industry, the, the traditional media industry, is at this amazing pivotal moment that we're, we're just about to see it really take off. I think rather than worry about our newspaper's going to die or not, I think that I believe that people all over the world are going to be able to access my stories in the, next, in the coming years in a way they never were able to before because we didn't print in, for example, New Zealand, unfortunately. My mum can't read my stories because we don't print in, in, in New Zealand. Um, but now she can read it on her iPad. Um, and Papua New Guinea, if you, as long as you have a, uh, access to the internet, you can read my stories on, on your iPad or on your laptop. And I think that's amazing, especially because um, and I even think it's amazing from a business perspective because if you think about it, we can add a million readers tomorrow and it's not going to cost us one extra cent. Whereas, you know, try and get a million more paper readers, we have to print them and we have to distribute them. And we think about the costs are, are, that are involved. Uh, we literally could see readers explode overnight and we, we wouldn't, wouldn't cost us anything. We, it would just be pure profits. So um, uh, in the end, I think... Um, I see physical newspapers a little bit like vinyl. I don't know if any of you still buy records on vinyl. There you go, DJs in the house. Uh, so, um, Mei Ling's a DJ, right? So, uh, so the, um, I know that, you know, people used to say the records, the idea of the record vinyl is dead, it's never going to be around. But now you can go to specialty stores in big cities and you can buy vinyl for people who really love to listen to music on a record or who are DJs. And, and I'm convinced that in the future, in Hong Kong, maybe New York, probably not in New Zealand, but in, in New York, in, in London, in uh, Hong Kong, I'll always, when I'm an old man, because I love reading a newspaper, I'll be able to go, or even not so old man, in the 20 years maybe, I'll be able to go into a specialty newspaper store, and I'll be able to buy a newspaper and smell it, and you know, go and sit there and drink a coffee, and not have to be rubbing the, my iPad. And I, I truly believe that's what, I mean, I don't think newspapers are ever going to die. I think they'll end up probably eventually they'll end up like, like vinyl does. Um, now I'm going to close with a really uh, heartening number from my perspective. Um, and this is very current, as all journalists should be. Um, last week, the FT reported uh, very close to 400,000 digital subscribers. Um, that puts total circulation for the Financial Times, including paper and uh, digital, uh, at 639,000. So we have 239,000 readers who buy our newspaper every day, and we have 400,000 who pay to read us online. Now, that 639,000 overall circulation happens to be the highest ever circulation in the 125 years of the Financial Times. So for me, that's a, obviously a very, very uh, heartening sign and uh, something that I hope means that... Uh, I'll be around for a few more years. I won't have to go into academia or, um, <laughs> or anything else uh, for a little bit longer yet. So um, on that very cheery note, I'm going to um, wrap it up. And uh, I can talk about the FT business strategy a little bit in the case of Apple a little bit if you like. But I'm happy to talk about whatever you want. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And maybe I'll change the screen because you have to look at my really embarrassing. <laughs> Questions? Who wants to ask the first? Doesn't matter about being first, does it? I have dozens, but I, I don't think I, I should start. I actually Ross. agree with you about um, the danger of tweeting. But for our, the youngsters around us, have they ruined their reputation even before they joined the workforce? It's a, it's a big issue in, uh, in the UK and US and other places. We've actually seen a few stories in the media about um, young people who, who weren't hired because of what they put on Facebook, drunken you know, a, a, you know, antics, and while they're at university, while they're at college. You know, um, it, it's a really big issue. And it's what I mean, I've always been really paranoid about is 
you know, a friend of mine took a photo of me, um, you know, jokingly holding my daughter over a balcony like Michael Jackson one time and then she put it on her, on her uh, Facebook and I had to call and say, look, you know, I work for a very reputable newspaper, I don't want to look like Michael Jackson. I mean, it wasn't that bad, but still, please, can you take down the photo of me? And I was on holiday in New Zealand just with my mates, you know, it was very much, very different from my, my uh, work life, but, you know, that's the danger, right? And uh, even worse than that, I have to say, is that some of my friends and even acquaintances from uh, you know 10, 15 years ago, I've started to post there like, hey, remember this time? And I have a uh, small confession to make. You can find these pictures online, unfortunately. I used to have long dreadlocks, um, which also doesn't fit very well with my image as a financial reporter. Uh, so you can, you know, when someone starts putting your dreadlock pictures of you when you're like 22 or whatever, up online, and uh, yeah, not so cool. Um, so I think. It's a real danger, and people should be really aware of it, because I know, for, for example, um, I, I don't know if the Financial Times does it, I'm pretty sure they would, but many, many potential employers will go first and look at your Facebook. We, as journalists, when we're like, trying to do investigative stuff, one of the first places we go is LinkedIn. We, we friend someone on LinkedIn. On, uh, we go and check their Twitter. We go and check their Facebook, and we try and get as much as we can. You can find huge amounts of information on, on people. And it's not just uh, you know, potential employers. You know, the NSA is watching you, the, uh, the Chinese government is watching what you're doing, but, but corporations are, are collecting a whole lot of information about you. What you. I mean, even what you search online, I use a VPN even when I'm not in China. I have to use a VPN in China just to do my job. But I, tr I use a VPN no matter where I am because I don't really want, um, you know, Walmart or whatever knowing what, you know, camping equipment I'm looking for. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just... I'm a little bit like, you know, I'm spied on so much in my daily job in Beijing, you know, I mean, they bug my phone, they bug my office, they bug my wife's phone, they follow me everywhere, you know, I kind of want to be as much as I can anonymous. And I think, you know, everyone should be aware of that and should be cautious when they're... Very true. So I was on a judging panel for some local award and we had to do due diligence and the due diligence is to go Facebook. on the website to yeah. find those applicants information. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, do a Google cool. search. You'll find a story I wrote about something ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to have it, right? I mean, we, we're actively encouraged to have social, uh, social media um, a presence because that's how we promote our stories. And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have a Facebook account or a Twitter account. I'm just saying be careful what you put on it. Now, so other people can put silly things, but you can be on there and just reading other people and you can be on there and, uh, you know, sending out very, very things about your stories that you wrote or, uh, you know, I mean, I just, I'm just very cautious. And, and it's, it's not... It's not bad for people. I mean, you can make yourself famous sometimes by doing this, right? It depends also what you want to do, but you should always be cautious a little bit. I mean, it's different. If I was an artist, I'd be putting the most outrageous, you know, if I was a, you know, trying to promote my latest novel or something, you know, it'd be probably very good for me to get some, you know, a bit of scandal and intrigue and... Dreadlocks. Dreadlocks, exactly. Wow, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's when I knew I probably wasn't going to be an artist. That's when I cut them off and went to work for the FT. But actually, um, I went into... A, I talked to the editor who hired me at the South China Morning Post because um, I had short hair by the time I went to work for them. And I told him I had, you know, I showed him a picture. He said, I would never have hired you if you'd come in looking like that. So <laughs> it is true, uh, you know, haircut and a real job is, uh, you know, it's a point in everyone's lives where, where we do it. So. <coughs> Julie. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, you, were, you were being very optimistic, uh, looking at it from the point of view of re readership. But you started your talk by um, mentioning some figures, you know, uh, big corporations buying up these traditional media. So, it, and you said the, 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 you and your colleagues were quite shocked. Uh, so, 
do you do you actually observe any change in the the um, direction of the, the the media like like Washington Post after it being brought up? Do you do you foresee any change in the editorial policy, in the contents, uh, any possible censorship? Okay, that's the first question. And the second question is about. Uh, Oh, uh, you mentioned that uh, six months ago, the Financial Times actually had a regional difference, but now it's no longer like that. So is, is it the kind of general phenomenon for other, other newspapers that, that is kind of, we're moving really into the global era, so there's no more regional difference, or is it simply Financial Times? Sure. Um. So first of all, um, I think, if, let's go back to, let's go back to this one. Um, I think there are a couple of ways to look at this. Okay, so the Boston Globe used to be worth 1.1 billion, now it's worth 70 million. That's a bit shocking and a bit depressing if you're a journalist or you're in the industry. And especially if you've watched how many journalists have been fired in the last uh, you know, decade, all over the world. Um, but then I would also look at who is buying these newspapers. Warren Buffett, the great value investor, right? He, his mantra is, you know, when everyone is panicking, uh, become greedy. When everyone's greedy, you should panic, right? So he's the ultimate buy low, sell high kind of guy. The fact that he maybe bought a little early, but uh, the fact that he's buying traditional newspapers, I think, is a very positive sign. He sees great value and a great future, presumably. I mean, he wouldn't buy it otherwise. Jeff Bezos the same and uh, even John Henry and you know so I think there's two ways to look at it. You can say well um, they're being sold but at least you know the LA Times went bankrupt nobody wanted to buy it um, and that was only a couple of years ago. Now at least these companies are getting close to bankruptcy and someone comes in and, and buys them up because they see that this that these and it's not just nostalgia I think. I mean Warren Buffett doesn't do things just for nostalgia he does them things to make money um, so I think that that's a really positive sign. But to your, to your point, um, is editorial policy going to change? I think there is a danger of that, absolutely. As I mentioned, you know, the sort of the age of the media baron, the newspaper barons, Randolph Hearst, and, you know, buying up all the papers and, and just deciding. Rupert Murdoch is a great example, obviously, uh, who is famous for at least influencing, if not directly in getting involved in the... Uh, editorial lines of his of his publications because he's a businessman right so what Ruf, Ruf Murdoch wants is he doesn't want to completely piss off the people who are going to give him contracts and deals and he wants to make sure that his papers don't undermine his own business interests in other areas so there is a real danger of that but it's already been a danger for a long time and in many parts of the world it's I mean you know the Communist Party in China for example which is what I probably know the most about um, you know directly controls all of the media directly. So, you know, um, I think that it is a real danger. I think that um, Jeff Bezos, for example, I think with the Washington Post, he's already pretty much promised to not get involved in the editorial side. He said he's going to save them from a business side, but he's not going to tell them what to write. Um, but it's been a tension forever. I mean, it's only, it's probably only been the last few decades and only really in America where I mean, the UK is still not fully independent media, I would say, in a lot of ways. So, I mean, it's only really the US that has, and for a short period of time, that was able, I think, to, to really separate the ownership from the, from the uh, you know, editorial line. I mean, the UK, we do it, I think, pretty well. But, uh, I mean, especially the FT. Uh, but, you know, you can see it with, especially Murdoch's papers. They would never write anything that was really, really bad about Murdoch. And when they do, they get fired. Um, so that is a real danger. Uh, but I'm, I'm optimistic about people like Bezos. Uh, and I'm optimistic that if we can start to really make money, then it will and, and become very, we're, we're more, we're more uh, uh, in danger of what you're describing if we're really in crisis and we're not making money and we have to be saved, because then We'll, we'll kind of, you know, if we're relying on a, you know, someone to save our jobs, we'll do what they tell us to do as far as editorial line. But if we're making huge buckets of money, 
they're not going to start to meddle with the formula, the secret source that we hopefully have. Now, on the uh, you're asking about the um, the phenomenon of the uh, uh, joint editions, single global editions. So that is, um, I think, happening more and more. But in the extreme, what's happening is people are doing away with print altogether. Newsweek is a good example. Um, you know, they were bought by the Huffington Post, or, was it Huffington? Daily Beast. Sorry, they were bought by the Daily Beast, and then um, they just Daily Beast got rid of the paper edition altogether. Um, you're seeing around the world people shrinking their their print circulation all the time, um, and we're doing that too because we're losing print uh, slowly and by sort of very small amounts. We're losing people buying our paper, but we're massively gaining people who read our our website. So yeah, it's definitely going to happen. I, like I said, I think the eventual end game is specialist stores will will still stock our beautiful pink. Uh, Newspaper, but that'll be it. Um, I, I don't think I'll be. I don't think I'll be. I'll be thinking about it. Perhaps I do. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to say, actually, The Guardian seems to be going in the opposite direction. Um, from my observation, anyway, The Guardian seems to be coming out with a US, um, a British, obviously, and, and also an Australian edition. There may be others, but they're the ones I'm, I'm sort of I'm aware of. and. They all seem to be. They all seem to be different. And in fact, they are actually sending. They're actually opening up offices in in Australia and the US. I think it's probably been you know, more established. So they seem to be following a slightly different model from the Financial Times. And I don't quite understand. I mean, actually, I don't understand what drives the the Guardian or where they get their money from. Is a, is a complete mystery to me because actually, um, they it seems to defy gravity the way they the way they're expanding. So that's, that's, that actually, that's just a comment, not really a question, but maybe you have something to say about that. But the other thing is um, your optimism being built on, um, on having more and more subscribers. But, but at the end of the day, how, do, how does that correlate with what I would, think, would have thought was your bottom line uh, would be the value, the value of, of, of your advertisers? You know, in other words, at the end of the day, you know your bills are paid, aren't they? Are they not? Or again, maybe maybe you need to say more about you know how how the business works. But I've always assumed that at the end of the day, your bills are paid by your advertisers. And uh, so, um, are you saying that when your subs number of subscribers goes up, then 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 the value of the advertising just grows exponentially? I suppose that's what you're about to say. But I. I'd be interested to hear how you how you actually how you answer that question. Sure, absolutely. Um, okay, actually, um, because the Financial Times is uh, has a paywall, um, what the numbers I'm talking about the 400,000 subscribers all pay for the content online. So um, they every single one of them will have to you know give us an annual subscription fee. Um, we, we're a little bit like uh, crack dealers. We give you eight, uh, eight free articles a month, so you get a bit of a taste, and then we slam you and make you pay for it, the next one. So uh, get so you hooked, hopefully. So basically, you're saying the subscriptions actually pay your bills. So uh, the Financial Times is very proud of the fact that about two or three years ago, our, subs our other business, so it's subscriptions and it's conferences and other things that we do, uh, is a lot more now than uh, advertised. So when, you know, the, the great problem we had in the financial crisis, for example, was advertising. Advertising revenue is extremely volatile. It, it you know, bounces all over the place. So one year it can be way up, and then the next year it's way down. And it's the first thing people cut when they're, when they're you know, hit a crisis. Uh, big corporations, they cut the advertising budget. It's the first thing, right? So we've tried very hard and moved very quickly, I think, better than most people, most organizations, too to uh, relying much more on, on our other revenue streams rather than, rather than advertising. Of course, advertising is still a big thing. That's why we have luxury watches on the front page every day. But um, we're trying to shrink it down and down because it's, it's just, you know, we can't survive when, you, when suddenly you lose 50% of your advertising revenue. You can't fire half your journalists and then hire them back next year when you get the, the watch companies come back. So, so we really... We're very lucky in that sense that people are willing, apparently, to pay for at least for financial news and for specialist news like we hopefully provide. So, so that's um, uh, one thing. 
but still, of course, advertisers are very important for us. And um, often it's not how many people read your paper, it's how well you can convince an advertiser, it's how rich you can convince an advertiser your readers are, right? So we want to be able to, of course, the Financial Times is read by Barack Obama and uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and, and people with billions of dollars to buy your jets and your yachts and whatever. So in that sense, the information about our readers that we get, the subscribers who pay, because then they have to fill out a form of who they are, what do they earn, you know, they can lie, right? But most people just put roughly, probably they talk it up a little bit, but which is good for us anyway. <laughs> they're lying to our advertisers, not to us. Um, so the key is that um, the more information we can gather about our subscribers, the better, because we can then, basically, we're selling that to our advertisers, right? And in the past with print, we don't, you know, we can, you can, fill out a survey, but it's much harder than, you know, um, when you're online, you just fill out one of those quick surveys and you send it back. We've automatically got that information. So I was going to describe, and I will get into it a little bit, I was going to describe our relationship with Apple, which I think is really, really interesting. And what they do to newspapers, they're, Apple is evil, man. Because what they do, at least for us, what Apple did is they said to us, well, you know, you've got this iPad app, and you, you know, you've got an iPhone and an iPad app, that's, that's lovely, we'll let you put it for free on you know, of course, you can download it for free on the App Store, uh, the Apple, you know, iTunes, whatever. Um, but when people want to buy a subscription for the Financial Times, Apple keeps 30%. And so we're like, okay, you know, well, if, we're buy if they're buying it through your App Store, you know, that's kind of reasonable. But what was completely unreasonable of them to demand was they said that they would keep all of the information about our subscribers, that when the subscriber signed up, uh, all of the, you know, the data they filled out or all of their search information, everything, Apple would keep that. We would have no way of reaching. We wouldn't know who our subscribers were. We wouldn't be able to sell that then to our advertisers and Apple would be able to sell it. And so in the age of big data, um, the more that corporations know about your searching behavior and about what you're interested in, the more valuable it is to them and they can sell it on to advertisers. So why the hell should we let Apple have that when that is in the end going to be by far more valuable than the two, you know, the 30 pounds or 50 pounds or 100 pounds they spend on a digital subscription. Us being able to uh, know who they are and what they do is much more valuable. So um, what we did is we told Apple to stick it, and you can't, uh, you cannot get the iPad app uh, on your uh, through Apple iTunes or the App Store at all. They took us off, so they said, "Okay, see you later. Good luck to you. Cast us into the wilderness." What happened is we built a web-based app, which was absolutely crap for about a year. Um, and I, I wouldn't be offended if any of you looked at it and decided you'd never read the Financial Times ever again. But now what we've done, we've invested a huge amount, and that web-based app is better than anything we had on the App Store and has you know, become extremely popular. And we've managed to cut Apple out of the whole equation, and it hasn't made that bad, it hasn't hurt our business that badly and increasingly you're starting to see other companies follow our model. Very quickly on The Guardian, um, they're following a strategy that we did 15 years ago. They're run by a trust, so they don't have to make profits so much. I think they're mistaken in the way that they're doing it, but they're following a different strategy, as you say. Um, uh, the Economist is another good example. We own half The Economist. The Financial Times own half of, owns half The Economist. and they're, um, I think their digital offering is, is a little bit behind. I think that they haven't managed to really um, nail it yet. And I think that's partly because they, um, it's the, the danger of success. You know, they were so successful in print. For years, they were just still expanding. There's something like 1.3 million print subscribers, and it was going up and up and up. Now I think it's leveled off, and now they have to really get serious about it. They didn't have to. They were still able to sell magazines to people. So. Uh, the, the Guardian, though, is, it's a, it is a trust. I mean, I believe in the idea of trust ownership um, by trust because it means that you don't have the danger of a, of a you know, activist owner and you don't have the danger of a, of a government owner. Or, you know. So I think trusts are a great way, but the problem is they're not always... They're often journalists, not business people, and I recognize we do need people who understand the business side as well. Um, so, yeah, maybe... I'll link out. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have a question. Um, I know that 
FTS launched a Chinese website, so how does it change things for you as a reporter slash editor? How does what? How does it affect you as a reporter? How does it affect me? Okay, so um, the FT Chinese website, we set up about eight years ago. So, uh, or maybe even nine years ago. It was, it was quite a while ago that we set it up. And uh, initially we set it up, um, this is off the record a little bit, because uh, it gets a little bit sensitive, if that's all right. If there are any journalists in the room, <laughs> I like saying that, because uh, it usually happens to me, but it's a little bit off the record. But um, the, uh, initially, because, um, initially what we did is we set up, it was basically just a translation website. So it would just take uh, English stories and just translate them into, into Chinese and just publish them on, on a website. We're not allowed to print uh, in China because we're not under the propaganda department. So, and, and FT Chinese is actually a advertising company officially. Um, and originally it was just translated copy. Now, increasingly we've, we've got people who are writing stuff in Chinese first, that is original content. Um, and I had a very interesting chat. I have to go to all sorts of, as the bureau chief, I'm also the far end, the, the legal person, legal representative of the Financial Times in China. So when the Financial Times is deemed to do anything naughty or bad, I'm the one who has to go in and get lectured. Um, but I also have to go to a lot of, uh, I call them Pai Ma Pi sessions, so suck up <laughs> sessions, where I have to go and suck up to government officials so that when they're yelling at me, I can go, oh yes, but let's have coffee and let's be friends. And, so they don't hate us too much. Um, so I do a lot of diplomatic work, really. Um, I was at something about a year or two ago, and it was, it's, uh, South, it was the State Council Information Office, which is the, they're in charge of censoring the internet. They're the real bad guys. Um, so you want to want, know why Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Google are not available in mainland China, you go talk to the State Council Information Office. Uh, anyway, I was at this um, event that they held, uh, and they came up to me and said, hmm, Financial Times Chinese, very interesting. I was like, oh, yes, yeah, very interesting. And uh, they were like, um, you're not really legal in China. I was like, oh, God, here we go. And then they're like, but you're not illegal. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, yes. And they said, yes, yeah, interesting, isn't it? And I said, mm, very interesting. <laughs> and uh, so left it at that, and we, you know, I cheered classes and said something nice about his kids or something. And uh, anyway, so it was a, it was a message, right? It was a, it was an obvious uh, intimidation message. And you know, luckily, I actually, I'm not in charge of FT Chinese. It's a completely separate operation, intentionally a very separate operation because. You know, for the guy who runs that, he's a, his name's Zhang Li Fen, and he w lived for 20 years in the UK. For BBC, he's a you know great journalist. He's a PhD in media studies, if there is such a thing. <laughs> Apparently, there is. Um, he runs this website, which, on the one hand, he's got to make sure it stays open because it makes a lot of advertising, and it has three million registered uh, users. Although it's free, it's, it is free. It's not paid for. But um, it has 3 million registered users, um, which helps us sell ads and, and boosts our overall reader numbers. Um, so he's got to make sure that the website doesn't get sh shut down. But, you know, he's got, a way, he's got to put up with phone calls from me every couple of days. If he hasn't pu published my story or hasn't properly translated certain bits of it or he's cut it down too short or something, I'll be on the phone yelling at him and say, hey, man, this is terrible self-censorship. You can't do that, blah, blah, blah. So not just me, then there's people in London, there's... there's outside readers who will complain and say, you're self-censoring and this is outrageous. And so he has, I'd say, the, the hardest job in the Financial Times and maybe of almost any media organization because on the one hand, if he gets that website shut down with a very sensitive story about the family money of whoever, um, he could, uh, you know, that's, he's out of a job and he's got 50 people who are working there who will be, you know, they'll be out of a job. And the FT will be out of a lot of revenue and profits. Um, on the other hand, if he self-censors too much, he's, you know, he'll, he's open to really serious criticism. So I think he does a very good job of that. I think he manages to balance very, very well. But I don't ever want to do that job. They've talked to me about one day maybe. I'm like, no, 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 not that job. So um, how, the way we deal with it, I see it as a separate operation. I see it as um, a very important outreach for me in China. When I go and meet people, they're always like, oh, FT Chinese, you know, like when I do an interview. And uh, I have to show them my business card, and then they know because of my 
my name in Chinese is quite different from my uh, English name. So then I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know you, Jimmy O, mm, Jimmy O, which is my Chinese name. Uh, so, um, yeah, no, I, th I think it's a very important um, part of what we do in China, particularly. Uh, <clears throat> what I, I, I want to do is to shift attention, just, just at least for a few minutes, to uh, um, the, the other side of information, which is taking it in, uh, uh, to look at it from the point of view of the reader. Uh, because I, I think very strikingly that both what you were talking about and what practically everybody has talked about was the presentation and the delivery of information, uh, which you know I think is enormously important. But uh, two two things struck me relatively recently in what in the way I was uh, using news. Uh, for some reason, I, I wanted to know what has happened about pirates at sea. Because it seemed to me I'd seen nothing about that for a little while. Uh, and uh, I was able to find out because of using Google. And I underline that, it was Google I was using. I'm not a user of uh, social media, uh, unless you count email. Uh, and, uh, but I, I assume that you can't find, you can't be an active news recipient uh, that way. The, it seemed to me that uh, a great thing that the internet has brought in was the possibility of being a, a more active recipient, an active reader, call it that. Uh, and then the, the same thing kind of happened at, at a much shorter. But by the way, the answer is, of course, that piracy had dropped enormously. And so it had uh, stopped being news. Uh, and, uh, I, well, that, that I, should have been a story. <laughs> uh, well, of course. Uh, the, the, uh, when you talked at the beginning about Pulitzer Prize earning things, of course, it's a characteristic of that kind of story that it, it picks up a longer term thing, which in fact that particular article that you're showing us, which I uh, uh, read on the, on the web, uh, that does take that long, longer view. Uh, the, the other example was the, the fires around Sydney, New South Wales, which I the particular interest because I have a daughter living in Sydney. But uh, that just suddenly dropped off the moment that the fires became less of a threat. Mm. It wasn't that uh, there was then a report that uh, the fires were had diminished. They just weren't there. Uh, now, what struck me was uh, that I could then, of course, use the, the internet to find out what I wanted to know. But it doesn't seem to me that either the traditional newspapers or, the, or, or, or Twitter or, or anything like that uh, really it does that. They are still passive providers of information, I exaggerate. And uh, so I, I, I want to ask, if we look further into the future, is it possible that one aspect of the future of news is going to be uh, uh, building on, on these possibilities that, that search engines have provided us with? Uh, so I think of Google as a very important news medium, but in this new way that it allows you to be an active reader. Um, so it was very interesting. The other night I, uh, I had the news editor of the Financial Times, who's a very important person in the, in the paper, was visiting me in Beijing. We went out for dinner and he said something uh, that I hadn't thought about that much before, which is um, there are some very worried columnists and uh, very worried journalists. Um, in Financial Times, but more generally in, in media, because for the first time ever, 
we can measure how many people are reading our stories and how many people click on our stories. And so for some columnists who have survived for many years writing these long, windy columns that you know, nobody really thought, oh, sure, you know, nobody, nobody understood them, but they all thought someone else understood them. And uh, now we can see you know, how many people are clicking on so-and-so's story. You know, it's Jamil's story about um, you know, the, <laughs> the third plenary session of the 18th party you know, with a headline like that. Is anyone actually reading it, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a worrying time in a sense for, for journalists that, you know, maybe people aren't reading it and we can now measure that. So, so that is really changing um, because, yeah, there'll be many people who want to read about piracy. And we can now, through, if you search on FT's own website, we'll be able to see how many people are searching for that term. And then the editors, editors, editors can look at that data and they can say, okay, we need more stories about piracy because everyone in Hong Kong wants to know what are the pirates up to. So, I mean, it is, I think that's already happening in a big way, especially I mentioned something called courts. What they're doing is very much actively doing the algorithms, working out what are people clicking on the most, what stories are people searching for the most, and then they're, feed, they're doing more stories tailored to, to that kind of, you know, to, to what the readers actually want. Um, you also, I think you're alluding to the idea of the news cycle where once something is no longer going to kill hundreds of people, it's suddenly off the news agenda. I've got to say that's, pro that's been the case forever. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, but, yeah, sure. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, I think that social media has sped up the news cycle so, so that we pick up and we drop stories faster but just because you have know, 24-hour cable news and you also have the internet, you can get things immediately and it, it's a trending, exciting topic, and then it's not anymore. Um, but at the same time, on the flip side, it's what we have what's called the long tail, which is the long tail for a story. You know, people will read it for a, a, you know, it'll spike, and then it'll die off, and then there'll be sort of people who pick up on that story later, you know, sort of search to Google or whatever, and we call it the long tail in news, and they call it long tail in many other things. But um, that it means that those stories are still available, they're still out there. If people want to read um, something I wrote in 2009 about a certain topic, or a certain topic becomes interesting and on the, in topical and in the news again, people will search and they'll get back to that story, whereas they'd have to go in the past to a library, look through a microfiche, and then you know, have to know it was there, and they'd have to dig it out. So but you want to know the current situation. Uh, um, the, the, then on the particular newspapers I searched through, I, right. I didn't get that, didn't so I had to, so go, had to go. Back. I, I had to find a specialized right. uh, site, right. which I get from Google. Site. You see, but I mean, I don't think it was a newspaper site. Sure, but I think if we were seeing enough people being, I mean, it gets to this question of news judgment, which we sort of pride ourselves on. But if if we're seeing through the you know data gathering and the the analysis we're doing that enough people are very interested in a certain topic, we also. Um, oh yeah. We, we have data available now. I mean, there are actually there's a whole team of people, and that's all they do is look through what are people reading, they analyze it. I'll tell you something really, uh, as, as part of this um, data analysis that we have, we've been able to look at when people read the Financial Times, and it's extremely interesting for us because um, what we found is in the mornings, and this came out just literally two weeks ago, we all got sent this and we all got a big, big shot, but in the mornings we get a spike of people reading at around 7 or 8 a.m. in London time, we're mostly looking just at London time, but 7 or 8 a.m. we see a big spike of people reading on their, on their desktops, and then it sort of, uh, narrow, you know, sort of plateaus a little bit, and then we see a big spike of people reading on their iPads or their iPhones as they're catching the tube to, to work in the morning, and then it dies off, there's a little spike at lunchtime, but then interestingly there's, a little, there's quite a big spike around 9 p.m., and people, before they go to bed, get back on their desktop and they maybe read the news at the end of the day. Now, guess when we publish most of our stories in the Financial Times? It's uh, 5 p.m. every day, so we miss the big spike in the morning. Um, we put it up there in time for them to read it before they go to bed, and the same stories are there in the morning when, they, when we hit the big spike in the morning. So we're, we're completely misserving our readers in the sense that they all will, uh, many of them will read it in the evening. They'll wake up in the morning, want to look at their FT on the sale. It's the same exact stories, it's the same exact website. 
that I saw last night, so maybe I'll go read the Times of London or you know, the Telegraph or, right? So, or The Guardian. Yeah. Or The Guardian, exactly. So, um, so, or Daily Mail, the most popular paper. <laughs> uh, so what that means is that we've got to change the way we deliver our news. We've got to give it to them just before 7 a.m. So they've got something completely fresh and new. And the great, uh, I mean, I'm trying very hard to make myself think like this because it changes my day around very, uh, you know, rudely, but the great opportunity we have in, in the Asian times... No, no, it's very convenient for you. Very it? convenient, is I could, yeah. if I get in early and I do a story, if I get it up by 1 p.m. Hong Kong time, it's the first thing that they're going to see yeah. in London when yeah. they get this big spike. So um, ideally, the first thing they're going to read about is always going to be about China, and uh, I'm going to win a Pulitzer because of that. <laughs> it's going to help. Your editor's in London, I think you told me. The editors, the, the editors that matter are in London. <laughs> so the chief editors and uh, the various editors. We have some editors in Hong Kong, but they're more fixing stories and sending them on. Yeah. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, but Brian. OK. Um, so but then the flip side to being able to respond to reader, or reader's demands being met more immediately is that uh, it seems like a lot of readers want to read stories that can con confirm what they already, well, there's that, yeah, but there's also this effect of people wanting to confirm what they already believe or think they know. Mm. And social media may, you know, those stories that you talked about from less reputable sources um, that maybe are, are spread through social media. Uh, people may only read the stories that confirm their particular point of view, and they, I, I appreciated your optimism that maybe the, the more reliable uh, big news organizations may eventually see these readers coming back to them, but may, maybe I'm a little pessimistic. I think there's this echo chamber effect online. Sure, I, I, I agree completely. If you, it's very, something very interesting if you look on uh, the South China Morning Post for the last year, I think it's come down a little bit now, but if you look for the last year, the main most read story for about a year was ugly mainland tourists doing nasty, you know, dirty, <laughs> spitty, something, something. You know, like. And it was a story from a year ago, and it just kept getting recycled to the very top because, as you say, it confirmed everyone's stereotypes about... And I, I have to say, I take issue with that. My wife is from, uh, from the mainland and from Shanghai, and I've never seen her spit once. Um, in fact, my <laughs> driving when I'm overseas is much worse than hers. She tells me off because I drive like a mainlander and a Beijing driver um, when I'm overseas. Uh, yeah, so no, I completely agree with what you're saying. It's, there, there is a danger. But I still think that, um, you know, people will always go and read. You know, for example, in the UK, if you're a Daily Mail reader, it's because you want to have your certain political views, or you're a Guardian reader, you want to have a certain political view, or a New York Times reader, right? You, you want, or Rupert Murdoch reader, you want your views reinforced. And people will still always do that, you know, I mean, and I think, but I think there's a real, a great opportunity for the Financial Times, which doesn't take a strong editorial stand on, on many things. We take different stands on different issues. As we say, um, as good journalists all, all should, we have uh, many strong opinions held very weakly. And I think that sums up the Financial Times views. We, we take you know, strong, view, you know, strong positions, but we can change our position when the facts change. And um, if you look at our editorial pages, it's a breath of fresh air compared to, say, the Wall Street Journal, which is neoconservative nutters, mostly. <laughs> no offense to all the neoconservatives in the room. But, um, uh, but I mean, it's really, it's one, you know what you're getting. You know you're getting one view, and nowadays it's Rupert Murdoch's view. Whereas the Financial Times will have uh, the Prime Minister of Japan will write something for us one day, and then Lee Keqiang will write something the next day, and they usually be arguing, or, you know, we'll, we'll get a very, very wide variety of views, and we pride ourselves on that, and, and on our, our own editorial stand, you know, we, we, I think we supported the Tories for many years, I mean, you do, as a British paper, support one party or the other, or the other, maybe, um, uh, and, but then we supported New Labour for a decade, and then we went back to the Conservative Party, and so... Um, I think there is a real appetite for that, especially in a global world where, you know, I'm from New Zealand and I have a U.S. passport, and what, what do I care about British politics, actually, you know? I'm more representative of our readers, and I think uh, there, is a, there is a definitely at least a niche for that, and 
if they want a certain view, they can go read the Telegraph. Well, they're not so bad. Yes. If you talk to the business side of, uh, of the Financial Times, we only want high net worth individuals, as they say. We, if you can't afford it, then, you know, too bad. <laughs> but uh, on a, you know, I mean, what the FT does very well, though, is provide, I mean, I know for some universities, provides free copies. And, you know, because we see people like yourself as the future readers of our, of our paper. Um, I haven't looked most recently at the demographics of our readership, but we do have that information. And it's surprising how many young people actually do, um, you know, it, it, the other thing that we've done, which I think, and I don't want to talk too much like the commercial side, but what we've done and we've worked hard at is because we're, we're like an aspirational brand, you know, like what we want is people like yourself going, wow, you know, one day I want to have, you know, when I have a good job, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is get an FT and, uh, you know, I'm going to get a subscription and, you know, it's, it's as aspirational as the watches we have on the front page or, you know, so, I mean, I guess from a business perspective, uh, and from a Financial Times survival perspective, what we want is people aspiring to read us, young people aspiring and hoping to eventually read us. As far as what you're talking about, I guess, is more the democratization of information and whether by charging a ridiculous amount of money for us, are we locking out many other people from our, um, you know, from, from our gorgeous information? And, you know, I'd, I'd say that um, there is so much available on the web. I'll give you an, a nice little hint. For most of uh, the websites, um, including ours, including the New York Times. This is really off the record, so uh, <laughs> if the Financial Times or anyone from the FT asks you about this, tell, I, I never said it. But uh, if you go through Google, uh, so if you go straight to our website or any of the webs, New York Times or anyone else, you'll get five free articles and then you'll have, they'll ask you to pay. If you go through Google, you'll get 15. And if you go through uh, Drudge Report or Huffington Post, you'll get as many as you want for free. You, so, so, you know, what we're there are ways to get information, and, and information is like money, it's fungible, I think. You know, digital information is, can always get out there. Even if it's, you know, you, you emailing your friend who has a subscription, they copy and paste and send it to you. I mean, you, I, I think that um, I'm not worried about information being increasingly locked in, you know, inaccessible silos. I think that's, that's never going to happen to that extent. And, um, I, but I do think that there, there should be a premium on high-value journalism, high-value information that that has that huge amount has been invested in gathering. It shouldn't be given away for free. I, I agree with Rupert Murdoch on that front. Um, that people should pay for, you know, they're willing to pay for a newspaper. Why shouldn't they pay for articles online? Because. We're crack dealers, I told you. <laughs> no, again, off the record. <laughs> Edit that out. No, um, uh, no um, I mean, I think there's some people are investigating that model of, you know, buying like, like uh, on Apple iTunes, you can buy one song. Um, you know, maybe we can, for, for very long feature premium articles, you, you click and buy it, you know, one single article that you really want to read. Um, but I think what we're doing is what many people are doing is bundling, right? We're, we're bundling maybe my stories, maybe not so many people are interested, but then the big famous uh, columnists, they want to read that person. So they have to read, you know, have to get mine as well. Or the other way around. The other way around. <laughs> you had a question? Yeah. There was one other point, which was if you're now relying on information, you're getting online research histories and stuff like that. 
Is it one of your tools where that might mean that the focus of news shifts away from the investigative into responding just to what people want to read? Yeah, I, I'm extremely worried about that. And so what I, um, what I see the danger being on a sort of daily practical level for me, from me and my journalists, um, the, the big danger I see is that we're, we become a pale version of the wire services. So, you know, every morning we read Reuters and Dow Jones and Bloomberg, and we're customers of those big wire services. They have many more journalists than we do on the ground in China, and so we'll read them first to get sort of, you know, have we missed any big news that's out there, you know, and our editors will also read them, and that's where they get, that's where they get all their news about China. So the danger for us is that we end up sitting in our desks just doing quick versions for the website of, you know, second-hand versions, which we could, I argue over and over again, I could be doing that in London. I could sit in New Zealand and do that. Why would I have to be in China? Why are they paying for me to live in Beijing to do that? So I fight against that phenomenon every single day. I'm always, I, I'm arguing, like I said earlier, that we should be saying if it's not in the FT, it's not, it's not really true or it's not you know, well sourced. We should also be leading the news. And we should be, the value add of having 20 people in China is that we go out and find stories that no one else has and then everyone else has to follow us. And that's the holy grail for any journalist is when you see your story go up and then you watch all of the guys you see at the pub in the weekend like all having to scramble and so ideally you put it up on a, late on a Friday night so they all have to do it on the, the, run after your story late on the late on the Friday night ruin their weekends um, uh, that's the that's the real holy grail um, but uh, yeah so I mean I think there's a huge danger and so I'm always and I because I recognize that and other people in the paper sometimes recognize that I'm always fighting because I think that the the more newspapers, what the great thing we have is the quality of our writing, the quality of our journalism, the quality of our judgment, right? So um, our, our, our news gathering, information gathering abilities, our writing abilities, and our judgment abilities, those are really what we should pride ourselves on. We're not just a wire service that churns it out, throws in a few quotes, and you can barely read it. You know, I mean, Bloomberg is a great example. They stack unconnected sentences. Uh, Simon would be uh, aghast. You know, I'm sure you are when you read when you read Bloomberg. It's like it's piled. It's literally unconnected sentences piled on top of each other with no connection between them whatsoever. And you know, we don't want to be that. So I, I, I'm arguing and I'm fighting for us to retain what makes us an aspirational brand. <laughs> so, and that, but that means setting aside time and money to send journalists, say, okay, this journalist is not going to cover spot news for a week or a month. They're just going to work on this big story about whatever. I think I should um, draw it to a close. And thank you very you much. Uh, uh, if we now had a vote as to whether newspapers are going to survive. Yeah, please. Who thinks they're going to survive? We yeah. probably think we should have a vote at the beginning survive. and the end. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm used to. I'm used to debating. So, yeah. so yeah. who thinks newspapers are going to survive? Yay. <laughs> who thinks they're going to die? <laughs> Nobody. Yay. Oh, one, one. Okay. Some will. Right, you're not invited. That's right. <laughs> okay, it was a great, uh, great evening. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh, We give you a memento of the, uh, of the occasion. Lovely. <laughs> and we get photographed yeah, as yeah. a reward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>